Hello dreamers and welcome back to Dialyon Wiss and the Dreamcatcher where we talk display in the media and the world around us. Today we will continue with the pearls of yesterday. Previously Abby sent an invitation to Hudson to be her date for the debutante ball and I have a theory about this which I'll explain a bit later and I am so excited. Abby tries on her dream dress without Diane. Now if you remember, her and Diane made this promise that they were going to try on their dresses together because it will be practice for when they try on their wedding dresses together. But Astrid was like, no, you're not inviting her because if you do, she'll try and steal ideas and I just don't want her yet. And Abby let Astrid get to her and she just invite, invited Joe. After she tries on the dress, Astrid gets a call from Eliza. And Joe said, you know, I think he, in the group text, you forgot to invite Dan, so I invited her. And Abby's like, oh no, the reason I didn't invite her was because it would get upset. Ashford would get upset and... I didn't want there to be an argument. So she's like, get me out of the dress now. But she gets stuck in the dress and the anxiety and panic gets worse and worse and she can't breathe. She's like, and she starts spasming. And she's like, no, I need to get out, I need to get out. I think she wet the dress a little bit. And, um, yeah, I think I just, she, I, Abby needs to learn to stand the ground, to use her voice. Because how is she going to be taken seriously otherwise? And she needs to put her, herself in other people's shoes. Like... How would Diane, how would I feel if Diane did that to her, you know? And also, I think the family is struggling with money problems because Abby has a conversation with her mom and Eliza saying don't tell Abby about this. You know, tell her after the ball because they're hoping the ball will bring in income if she, that's the reason they're pushing her so hard. <laughs> hard to win because if it, she wins, fam um, the other rich people in the town will give them, you know, business and money and so they can get out of the money trouble but Abby takes it as oh she because they talked about Eliza's cousin to be Abby's date and she thinks oh no they're gonna they're gonna try and buy a date and then when she really thinks about it and looks she finds these contracts she's like wait a minute Eliza's family is also rich, so why would they need money? So if she's like, something's going on there. And yeah. Alright. Um, I am going to try and read to chapter 11. Like I said, but my voice is already going. So, um, we're just going to try our best. I also have an announcement but I'll tell you at the end of the chapters. 
Alright, with all that being said, let's begin. <coughs> Chapter 9 Are you okay? Joey asked, putting my sweaty hair away from my face. Embarrassed, but still in one piece, I whispered, I needed clothes. He saw me naked. I'm burning up. My imperfect boobs and uneven hips. I sweep the back of my head over my hand over my forehead, eyeing the sh string of pearls that I ended up on the counter. Joey slipped me into my sundress without a word. It's an effortless task for her. Joe, he and Di Joey and Diane had gotten me dressed and redressed over the last several years, more times than I can count. My cheeks blaze with heat. Can you make sure the pearl necklace gets back in the glass counter in my room? You've got it, boss. He gives me two thumbs up. Seriously, that necklace is worth a fortune. More important, importantly, it connects me to my ancestors. Every pearl is in its place has a special meaning. She nods and puts on imp impeats. Wow, it's my precious. Her Lord of the Rings and Pressing is so good, it's scary. Thanks, I'll go and see Hudson. I take in three long breaths. Hudson twits my curved body, not in the sexy way, where he can't keep his hands off me. I don't dare glance at myself in the mirror. I already suspect every inch of me is beet red. Barely getting into the living room, a bouquet of lilies appear in front of my face. Your favourite, if I remember correctly. His voice is less confident than before. You okay? Sorry if I hurt you. I take the flowers for me. Thanks. A smile sneaks onto my lips. He accepted my invitation. So many girls have asked him and failed, and he said yes to me. Here's the thing. I don't think he's seen the invitation. I think he did this on his own accord. I... Uh, that's, like, one thing, I think. Although I still need to know why he ghosted her because they I think we need to talk about you know if you actually care about me why didn't you talk to me talk to me for like out of years I mean look friends could go without talking for eons and eons and they can still be best friends that happens in life that is life but the fact that you know not even a high how things I think there's something more to it than just you know I don't know so many girls have asked asked him and failed and he said yes to me. Wow, that letter works fast. He read my note and wants to be here for me. I focus on that and only that. My giddiness is on full blast, but I can't let him see it. I take a deep breath and call upon every 
etiquette lesson I've ever had. No celebrating until we plan out the next several days. He stands tall, his posture confident, and his chin high. There's a gleam in his eye. Tailored black Gucci slack draped over her looks. Louis Black Valentino Oxfords. He wears his black silk suit jacket like a model. Every part of him is polished. The buff suit jacket, uh, shoulders, the leather belt looped around his waist, the slacks that hung his legs perfectly. He's clean shaven and not a hair is out of place. No trace of scrubbing Steve Hoodie Guy from yesterday. I cross one arm over my chest so form to form a shield. I was naked in front of him. The feelings just won't leave me alone. He's not saying much. He's not attacking me yet. I feel under attack with his eye every glance. He's lost. Lives in life hasn't has me dumbfounded. I glance everywhere for his face, the hackling fireplace that always thick burning, a black piano that has always automatically played classical music in the background. The silver picture that is always on the oak dining table, pushing his blonde hair to the side. He reveals an expensive looking watch on his wrist. You look good, he says, a smirk teases the edge of his mouth as he catches a glimpse of himself in the hallway mirror behind me. His coy and cocky smile pushes my cheeks. I step walk I stop walking at his mouth and work my way up to his soft hazel eyes. Thank you, I slowly move away. You look elegant. I clear my throat and nod. Politically, I love Louise. See, I can't put a full sentence together. He winks and licks the side of his mouth. Oh, so smoothly. It's nice to see you again. The front door clicks open. It sounds farther away than it actually is. Oh, I think it. I have this. I came over to ask you officially to be your escort, the bull. He said, his mouth moving in slow motion. I fix an invisible hair behind my ears to give myself time to process his words, the realness of the question coming from Hudson. His eyes staring into mine is too much. My chest, thump, my chest thumps and I have to pinch myself to make sure that this isn't a dream. My inner twelve-year-old self is shy than the Hottest guy in town wants to be my escort. I deny I do a gutter jam and jump up and down in my chair. Figuratively speak, figuratively, I can't say it. Figuratively, figuratively speaking. Joe, Joey, and somehow Diana next to her whispers for my attention to them. They stare at me, Hudson lowers to one knee, and once again that closeness over, overpowers me. Oh, I can't get my words out to him. I'm so sorry. I'm trying my best. We can do this. Okay. I, I'm not in the book, but I, I, I kind of feel overwhelmed. Because, like, if, if, okay, hypothetically, if some guy said to me, I would be like, okay, yeah, this is, I'm, uh, I, yeah, I, it's a, a fact, I think, if, I think, it's going to, her and Diana are going to have words, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna start. Yeah, and poor Jo, she's like, I'm, 
I'm sure everyone's been in the situation where two of your friends have been in an argument and you're stuck in the middle and you're like well either you know one's right one's wrong or both of them are right or both of them are wrong and it's like well if I go if I say I'm with this person that uh, it's just I, I being in the, in the middle, being the peacemaker is the hardest I think because you're like, you want everybody to get along and it just doesn't work like that and it, it's like people picking sides and that even when you're like an adult that doesn't stop, it just gets worse. So... I do feel sorry for like Joe because she's like gonna be stuck in this situation where she's like I understand where Abby's coming from because she doesn't want because it will probably blow up with with Astrid and her mom and it will be just this big thing but at the end of the day you've had this promise with Diane for a long time and you've broken it and like I said before, Abby needs to start using her voice. Mm. I stay at the flowers. That would be lovely. I pause. And gather my thoughts. Yes, I accept. I was going to lesson for a dance lessons. Yeah, okay. He paused, staring at me as if I to ask him to dance at that very moment. So I overload. Of course, I want to, but Diane, and all over my lip, lip, trying to find the words to ease the frown. Hudson rises and takes the cue that I need to talk to my besties. He waves and slightly nods, wanted to wait. Hating to watch him go, I w work my eyes to a, a never biting Diana, giving her a filthy look. She stares at her polished grace stilettos. I'm happy you got Hudson. Thanks, I'm sorry. I wanted to invite you to see my dress and put Ashford. We never hide secrets from each other. Whether it's an outfit, a new tea, or a celebrity cross, we've always been open books with each other. So, Astrid rules our friendship. Diana fixed me with a hard look. Let's stop pretending. Every time I mention, mention dressing up in our gowns, you get saying it's not ready, but you've been designing it for months. It's because you secretly want to win, Queen, and think out that from you. No! I want us to be the, do, to do the ball together. Don't be upset. I stopped my sentence and tore my hair with fingers. Astrid has been extra controlling lately. The last thing I want to do is lose my best friend because the stress of the world is getting to everybody. I'm so hurt that I want to split in half like an atom, she replies and abruptly turns. She marches towards the door with Joey following behind. Take a bath and chew some gum. Joey hands her pack from her backpack. Stop walking. So... That. Where are you going? If I knew Diane at all, tomorrow she would call down and we can talk about our dresses, hopefully. I don't think it's going to work like that. I think she's extremely hurt and you both need some space to figure out what you both want. When they exit, I swallow the lump in my throat. I find my phone and text Theo, the longest message of what just happened with Diane. He yes, has her to see me. Ask any time I feel broken or weak. 
He's the person I turn to. Sometimes without thinking. Ever since Fafi passed away, Thea has taken Fafi's place as my protector. No matter if I'm stamped my hand with more sticks or get mean comments on social media, he's the first to come to my rescue. He's my safe place. Following, I sent Diana a text of a poodle and a polka dot sweater. She thinks fluffy dogs is a enclosed are the most hilarious visual ever. I add that I don't want the ball to get in the way of our friendship and that I'm sorry I was scared to stand up to Astrid. She needs to stop doing that though. Following, I sent Diana a text. Oh, did I put it? Sorry. Everything will be fine. I say, turning towards the hallway ramp that loops towards the basement, checking on the team, giving me a peace of mind. Otherwise, I'll be upset about Diane the entire day. I don't want to do that. Yes, it will be. Hudson says, materialising from around the corner. Oh, hi! I fixed my posture. I paused for an awkward moment. Uh, what's up? I never said that. Neither one has said that. Where are you going? The basement. He, he casually slips his hand into my, his pant pocket. Yes. I'm thinking about it. I said, voicing my thoughts out loud. With that, I turned down the hallway, decorating with fruits. Painting against ivory wallpaper and heavy tan curtains on a large window. Hudson follows. I like that he follows. His warmth next to mine. It's nice. We ex chapter 10. We exchange a few glances until he asks me how I'm feeling. Dan just left, I say a little hearted. It's somewhat frustrating she chose to be mad. I think she has a right to be mad though. Or did you forget about the promise you guys made when you were kids? I got the perfect cure for that. He spins around and walks backwards. It's not like I didn't invite her to be with me. Talking to him is easier than this time around. It's as if we're back to our old closeness. Her hurt may be coming from somewhere place else. Like the reminder of not being invited to a party or something like that. I spot the antique left deco leaf decoration engraved wooden door. Yeah, maybe. She could be having an off day or upset about something else. I rest my emotion and focus on the next task at hand. I turn the knob and push the door open with my f fortress before you venture in. I warn Hudson, it's a bit dusty. Is it still haunted? He asked before me, behind me, with ghosts and everything. What's first time? This had been our hideaway, the place where we, we played I Spy with my little eye when we were kids. I don't believe in ghosts, he said, or anything you can't actually materialise. The comment passed as I saw, as I, st as a stale rose or your scent hit me. Just filled us through the air when we enter. The hundred year old mirror lies across the wooden nightstand. I switch on the centre, century old chandelier with a modern touch added I did replace the Avril light bulb, the only replaced items in here. It's a mini museum. The contents of all of my family's history. There are items from the 
ancestors on my mother's side who migrated from France and Colombia and some from Barbie's family and ancestors from Spain and Brazil. Raven baskets, bird pictures, golden bracelets and small wooden toys. The walls are packed with books, lamps, jewelry, miniature statues, coins and every kind of brass and gold gadget. It's a re rectangular room with a window at the top of the top right corner, just above the ground level. Candles in an old fashioned holders are, are mounted in the wall of regular and first verse Papi uses to instruct the staff to never clean the room because he wanted it to be a secret space. Secret, I think. He wanted to be the only one to care for everything because he did so with love. Dozens of first edition book line the one wall. The largest item is a 24-foot painting of the first train in Randa from the 1900s. A collection of glamorizing gems and rock shining rocks and clouds of diamond tables. How the things we make and how we ended up where we are is truly fascinating and it is truly a fascinating study. I can spend hours with old things uncovering their past and ma mapping out their history. The Reem is a treasure tray to me or an archaeological site. No one comes down here except for me. After it complained, it looked messy and scrubbing and just gorging. And mother fusses over how every corner is dusty. Some places in the mansion are more occupied than others. I'm the only one who cares enough to spend time here because I know no one else cares too. And thus it makes it my own place. Across the room, the surface of a small cabin has housed my personal collection. First grandma, first mini ticket, first toothbrush, first handmade wooden doll by Poppy. Priceless, but only to me. I started the collection at three years old when I got my first dolphin necklace. The dolphin was my first imaginary friend. There's a special magic to fit, magic to, to the first. They deserve to be cherished. I suddenly remember Hudson is watching me. Just in all the piles drunk, I say and hurry to see all my old things in my mind. My fossils are cool, but I'm mistily out loud that I want things to be preserved. It's not cool. It's one thing to collect antique decades and centuries old, but my collection is private. Hudson slowly rotates in a full circle and whistles. This is nothing. You should see my yarn collection. I laugh. You're funny. He waves off my scepticism. I'm serious, but don't tell anyone. It's a secret. Okay, I never imagined he had a yarn collection. He never says anything about it, though. I wish I knew where I... I stuffed the... Holy scarf he made me. Hudson. Enormous smile widens. You like the scarf? He pulls out a purple and black tangle of yarn. My grandmother helped me make it. I go and poked a finger through that a hole. This is not a scarf. This is the summer. Why would I want a scarf? He shrugs and exhales deeply as if disappointed. Also, this is a flashback. Thought you might want to have something to keep you warm at night. My other brother says it's, it's how you tell a girl you want to have a slumber party. 
with it. I giggle again. You are a boy. I can only have some parties with girls, don't you? Don't you have some apart? Don't boys have some parties? Boys don't do that, says his older brother from behind. Us? He's 20 years old. But he tells over us. Hudson knitting is. Hudson, knitting is not how you get girls, I told you. It's all in the fussy card and nice hair. He slides his hand over this of his head and folds his arms together with a snake. Hudson does his best to in intimidate. Copy his, his brother, but his smirk ends up in a Jack O'Lantern grin. I laugh one more. Boys are so weird. At least Theo could talk about summer party. Theo is my best friend. Roger turns cheeks turn red and he storms away. Ah! Could that be why? Could he feel replaced by Theo? I mean, yeah. I mean, at the time she was that. Yeah, that must hurt. I don't think she's realizing she's hurt him before. I start back to the present, wishing once more I knew Hudson better. Why did you start knitting? My Nona was would knit. I like experimenting with the yarn and needles. Hudson leads again to cabin. I love hanging out with her more than knitting. She told me that knitting gifts are the greatest gifts, but when I made a scarf for someone, it didn't go well. Now I knit in secret and volunteer at the senior centre to teach old folks. Nothing impressive so far, but it's rewarding seeing dandelion or angel learn to knit, even if they forgot how to do the next day. That's selfless of you, and I love the scarf you gave me. My stomach drops. I hope I wasn't the reason he doesn't openly knit. I'm sure if I really searched for the scarf in a story spot, I could find it. You should post pictures on socials. Hudson deflates. It's over the... Hudson deflects. It's over the wall. Walls dusty here, he says, spinning around. Definitely makes it special. I stare at the thick layer of dust on the cabin. Part of me wants to wipe away the dust. Uh, the other wants to treasure it. Sense of... Antiquity, the history of the dust particles. In this eerie silence, as if the ghosts and spirits are watching us. Is this a fire? Flying Hudson drops into an eight foot step decorated with crowns. This must be worth millions. Yeah, it's from ancient Egypt. My grandparents got it. I'm sure half of these items probably can go for millions. One of a kind and think that are rare and unquaint, enough to be in a museum. The town once had a museum, but the Hitler's bought it and turned it into a law firm. Hudson waves the dust away and sneezes, sneezes knocking up more dust on himself from the frame. He, he, he shoulders dirt, his hair looking old and grey. I grab a napkin from the purse hanging on my arm. Rest and was to, was to him. Lean down, I said. I say he abides, and we're so close. I almost inhale all particles. I swipe the napkin over the side of his shoulders and neck. There's a mole on his neck, paired with a few freckles around it. I don't stare too long because he's clearly watching me, analysing his smooth skin. Suddenly he sneezes, and I shriek, laughing. The dust that was around us, and now my hair is old and grey looking. I really should clean up. It's embarrassing sometimes to you to let things fall into a rhythm and a cycle, but a best spotless look can give old a shine. 
while cleaning. I might even discover artifacts that have no new stories to tell. We can leave, I add immediately, now that I'm trying to impress him, but I was. But if I was, this would be, wouldn't be the way to do it. No, I like it here. He hops up, he hops up and I'm into the part uh, of this room, the room near the phone. Okay, and you used to say that each object has a strawberry. We shall remember that. When well, I sneak a glance at Hudson, he gives me one back. Hands, hands clap behind his back with a dismal on his face and clothes. He lost some of his polish from earlier, but I like him this way. Now he's fallen on looking in my direction, he's in it grey. Those purely whites could be commercial all by themselves. He didn't breathe. He looked like a cardboard cut out, just smudged and all. There's a sort of subtle light to his face from the dim sonalia swinging from the ceiling. The frosted glass from the window gives him a hazy sign. Hudson gets more handsome the longer I study his strong jawline and almost sh St. Hazel eyes a rust of heat burns across my cheeks. He holds my eyes with, with a long stare. The interesting in his gaze does something straight to my insights. When he steps closer, I back up and then something other than Hunter needs to warrant my attention. I realize that being alone with him gets my brain all jumpy all over. Jumbled up. A golden picture frame hangs next to the, fr the frame in 1920s newspaper clipping with a recap on the debutante ball. I burst my head around my neck. Look, I point it. That's my great great grandmother with the pearls in the very first debutante ball in Brenda. Hudson strides over, pushing his face closer to the cliff and noises the pre-roll. They were fancy. We're so going to add fancy down. He does a dance across the room, kicking off a head of dust. When I giggle, he dances back to me, finishing with a bow. He sneezes again, I laugh. We can go. I slowly rolled out of the room, leaving him to sit at the door behind us as we headed back down the hall to the living room. I find myself telling him everything without pause. I have an in intense schedule today. I have to do to kids, take a business class and help the athletes and I have a summer school. Other tutoring gives me community service hours but it's the it's honestly more rewarding to see someone's face when they finally get it, whether that's be math, history or French. Making someone feel smart is the best feeling. This early in the morning, he took to he, he chewed Rocky for his own good. Yes, as much as I wish Hudson and I could stay in the antique room forever, a speed ahead, T Jack's telling me how one day he'll show me his yarn collection and how the needles work together with the yarn. It all sounds exciting, even though I'm not into string stuff. In the foyer, the front door swung gave him. Mother enters with his with our client, Mr. Lee, and his daughter, Natasha. Her smile bigger. <laughs> The smile is as big as the sun. Today we have several defense worksheets to complete. Mr. Lee wants to get a heart design sapphire necklace for his wife's birthday, I whispered to Hudson. My mother is having me treating Natasha for an hour as a favour, but I'll do it even if mother wasn't getting something out of it. Tutoring kids is my favourite. 
if I help you and you get done early, can I take take the remaining time? He asks. Sure, I say, loving the idea of more time with Hudson. It's as if he reads my mind. Mr. Lee stops and answers a vibrating phone. Don't flip out, he huffs and hey, If Sylvia gets put out of the company, I want to make sure I get her last design. He says to the caller, bossing past me. I replay the composition in my head. Mother is being pushed out. The eight year old twirl the eight year old twirls in her tutu and maybe a suit. Bonjour Natasha saying good Good job, you said it that perfectly. I motioned her to the desk in the study. Today we're going to learn about how to order food. My stomach drops thinking about the possibility that mother could be jobless. There's no way that can happen. I refuse to believe it. There must be an explanation. Must be more context than the worst case scenario playing in my head. Natasha skips across the palace floor. I want to order, order, order watermelon cake for my dad. He loves anything watermelon. She goes to herself and dances into her seat. My dad and I love to go to the man in the Terry diner. She spins it like a chair and wiggles her legs. And then my dad. That's great, I say a bit louder than I in- intended. I open the binder with shaking hands. Let's get started with writing. I push away the, the pain of jealousy. Hey, of the privilege Natasha had to spend time with her father. I wish I could open the black bag they had brought over, but at the same time, it's too hard. I have peeked into the tiny open side with some bell, worn out piece of leather, part of a book. It could be an old edition or something. We read together. Either way, I'm not sure whether I'll be ready to uncover what's inside. I can handle the pain that comes with it. Remembering what once was, when I can handle a little girl talking about her father. I, I can't even handle finding out why this company could be falling apart. But what I hate the most is how Poppy death took our normal life and turned it into a forbidden memory we can't talk about. Maybe I actually want to talk about it. Not doing it, not doing so, it's just so hard, as hard. Natasha hums a sort of song to herself, writing writing French words on Gratia de Fancy Sibyl Plate. Sibyl Plate. Your writing is way better than mine, Hutton says, glued to her pencil sweat. You must be a straight student, she nods and goes on talking to you to is it like it's a tea party yeah. on the work seat. I say deeply on the mind myself of what Poppy taught me. That's why plans are more perfect than my own plans. Yet, is Poppy death sinking the business? What if Mother is paying Eliza to do something illegal just to cause a flight? What secret is everyone hiding from me? Hudson meets my pain gaze and winks. His presence make everything bearable. His attempt at pronouncing French word gets Natasha a meat giggling. I want to say how nice it is to have him here, but I keep the thought to myself. We end up spending a longer than usual with the work suit because Hudson keeps mis- teaching Natasha what the words mean. Mother invites the Leos to stay for once. Mr. Lee seems pleased with his purchase and where my tutor in. Natasha shares her new friend's places with him. Mother smiled I was looking almost relaxed. Then again imagining it, it then again image is everything and people are really good actors. I need to get out of here. If I stay I might cry and that would be worse than being naked in front of Hudson. 
there's no handbook for how to react if someone loses a jar. I'll eat later, I say, and excuse myself. My mum has a junk food drawer when I want some comfort food. For some this was in my ear. You free now? A little bit, I pause because it's best to leave, but I can't risk him seeing a side of me he won't like. I can't risk doing anything to scare him off as my escort. Perfect. Let's go steal the limo. As if that statement isn't ridiculous enough, he ha hands to the front room. Hudson has to be joking. Mother and Mr. Lee are in deep in conversation, barely noticing our departure. Natasha plays with the food, talking friend, phases to the silverware. I pick up speed, circling into the foyer and pass the marble table. Hudson presses a silver button and the main door opens. He glances back at me, throwing me a cocky smile that's full of trouble. Uh oh. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I think what could possibly happen is the the loss of Abby's dad has impacted her mom uh, to the point where she's struggling mentally and maybe even physically it's hard I mean you always with grief you always think you're alone but there's always somebody else that is suffering in the same as you and I think it might help if all three of them just sat Abby, her mom, her sister Astrid sit down with a hot chocolate or a drink and just see what I miss my dad. We don't talk about we don't talk about him. You're taking down all his stuff. I uh, and we're not doing so great. So, you know, what's going on? I also think maybe because we had a flashback to when Hudson gave Abby the scarf when they were little and Abby Abby was like, you know, um, um, she was talking about Theo and, um, Hudson got jealous maybe that's the reason he didn't talk to her anymore because he was getting she was talking about Dio too much maybe there was a bit of jealousy I also think she's Abby's I mean, not really like listening she thinks um Diane I don't Things he realises like for her and I think he just needs to be like put herself in Diane's shoes and everybody else's shoes because she's not the only one. Oh, the announcement. Okay. I did an interview with Includis and it was so fun, so relaxed and I I really enjoyed it. I was so so nervous like beforehand. I was like, why if I say the wrong thing? Why they don't like me? What if um, something happened to my computer? I was so overwhelmed, but they made me so at ease and so comfortable. I, it was just... Thank you so much, Includers, <laughs> for letting me do this. And I will let you know when the interview goes live. I just, I'm just so grateful for them, for not only giving me the opportunity to read this book, but you know, giving me the chance to be interviewed <laughs> and yeah. 
please check out the website and they have other books for buying and thank you again so much and um i'm hoping to do a a um just chatting video at some point because i want to do some recap of about you know what's been uh, going on and what i plan to do in the next couple of months um that being said dream big my dreamers you deserve it <laughs>